Yesterday we left off talking about the uh, Mexican-American War. We talked about causes and conduct of the war. We talked about how the conflict over Texas was one of the main causes of the war. The fact that Texas had become a state. The fact that uh, the territory in dispute had been part of Mexico for centuries, or New Spain. And how the United States is, was in many ways to blame for provoking the war. And because the war goes so well for the United States, people often think that the U.S. specifically knew that. And, and again, that's not the case. Remember with 1812, the United States in many ways entered that war very willingly, and it went disastrously. So there was no foreknowledge that, that the United States would dominate in a war with Mexico. It just sort of happened that way. But is probably responsible for the majority of the blame and for welcoming and bringing about a war that maybe did not have to happen. Although, uh, it's probably also fair to say that the United States could not have annex Texas without maybe eventually getting into a war with Mexico over that, even if the U.S. had acted less provocatively. The conduct of the war itself, we talked about Zach Taylor's Overland campaign uh, directly through northern Mexico, Donovan and Kearney through northwestern, uh, what was then Mexico, reducing forts and missions, and then the knockout blow of Winfield Scott's Marine campaign where they landed at Vera Cruz. And uh, that probably is more helpful. Landed at Vera Cruz and then uh, marched to Mexico City, sieged at Chapultepec, and uh, captured Mexico City. Shortly thereafter, uh, the Mexican government initially refused terms. The treaty was eventually worked out where... Uh, about a third of Mexico's land was ceded to the United States and then followed up by the Gadsden Purchase, which was done mainly to secure a southern transcontinental railroad route for the United States. The next thing we could be asked on the IB exam with regard to Mexico uh, the bullet point reads, Mexican-American War, 1846 to 48, causes and effects on the region. So as I said, we've, we should be well-versed with causes. Effects on the region. With that, we'll talk mainly about effects on Mexico and on the United States. Uh, effect on Mexico is the loss of a massive uh, chunk of its territory. It uh, perpetuates instability in Mexico. As I refer to as Santa Ana, he comes in and out of power a number of times. Uh, it discredits the government in Mexico, and in a short period of time during the American Civil War, uh, Mexico will actually be taken over temporarily I don't know if you knew this, taken over temporarily by France. And they'll put an Austrian Archduke, Maximilian, on the throne as the, as a, as a king of Mexico, as a, sort of a puppet ruler to rule in, in uh, the name of France. And so the Mexican-American War is a, is a major blow to Mexico and fuels instability in Mexico. Uh, fuels a relationship that is uh, strained for some time. If you even recall uh, uh, with World War I, there was little reasonable hope of this, but Germany still held out against hope that they would maybe persuade Mexico to declare war on the United States as part of World War I uh, and fight over this Mexican cession territory, which by then that had been quite a while. That had, at that point, that would have been as many years ago as World War II or the Korean War just about is now. So, I mean, it would have been pretty old news, but still within the living memory of people who were alive. So at any rate, Mexico, some bitterness for some time. Uh, 
give, it gives rise to the relationship in the Americas of the United States as the power uh, in the Americas. And that, and that most other countries, Mexico especially, but Latin American countries, are going to sort of be uh, inferior to the United States in many ways. Uh, particularly militarily, but it's going to set up economically as well. Effects for the United States. A few things. Write it down. Effects for the United States. One, uh, it gives the United States a presidential candidate and president in Zachary Taylor, the victorious general who in many ways, provoked the war, well, specifically in one way, by building a fort in a, in a piece of land that Mexico said was Mexico and had been Mexico for centuries. And he built a fortress there. The Mexicans objected. And when he refused to disassemble the fort, it led to hostilities, which then led to the declaration of war. So Zach Taylor, popular war hero, we'll get a president out of that. Next, and maybe most portentously, is if you look at, uh, well, this map, you notice a massive territorial increase for the United States. And a large chunk of territory that was not addressed whatsoever by what famous uh, compromise or understanding that we've previously talked about. Well, the Mason-Dixon line was not um, formal. That's more of an informal way of saying it. But the Missouri Compromise line, which said that the entire Louisiana Purchase, which was everything west of Mississippi, was to be free of slavery north of Missouri's southern border, which meant that more or less only really Arkansas had been left as retirement ground for, for future slavery expansion. Well, what already gave rise to more expansion for slavery was Texas, when Texas was annexed, their constitution was accepted, and now this vast swath of territory in the West. Because remember, if you, in my opinion, if you had to say what, what the one, if you had to very simply explain what the causes of the U.S. Civil War were, the issue that things really hinged upon, it would be what? Territories. Just slavery, right? right? False. Slavery in the territories. The extension of slavery to the territories or the non-extension of slavery to the territories. That was the issue that was seen as such a hot-button issue that it alone largely, well, not it alone, it leading many other factors toward the country apart. So the expansion is a big consequence of the war. Uh, it gives rise to something that we'll see later, or it, it perpetuates and, and fuels later, something, you, you know, if you ever played the Oregon Trail game, it fuels something called Manifest Destiny. Have you ever heard that? Uh, I think no one ever explains that term. A destiny is what you're destined to do. It's sort of your fate. It's what you're going to do regardless of what happens. For something to be manifest, does anyone know what that means? No. What? No. No. Well, not exactly. For something to be manifest means it's plain to see. Manifest means plain to see. For example, we might use the phrase of, ah, scoring 100 on this test is a manifestation of your intelligence. Your intelligence has been made manifest by your A on this test. Does that make sense? That's the, the definition of the word manifest being used in that phrase. And so it's to say that it's our country's manifest or obvious, plain to see, our manifest destiny is to settle the entire continent. Does that make sense? Had you ever heard that word, not known really what it meant? Yeah, I was probably in college before I figured it out. But that's what we're talking about. It gives rise, and if you look at the march of history, 
it looks pretty manifest that it was a destiny. You look at the end of the Revolutionary War in, 18, in 1783 when Britain gave the U.S. everything east of the Mississippi. Then you look uh, 20 years later, the Louisiana Purchase. And then you look uh, oh, 25, 30 years later at Texas. You look 10 years later at the Mexican Cession. And it's just one after another after another. Each generation, or every half of a generation almost, has its own massive expansion of territory. And so it fuels manifest destiny. Okay. So, transitioning from uh, our nation-building bullet point on, eight, on uh, the Mexican-American War and its effects, we're going to begin, really, our first discussion of the Civil War. And our subject is the origins of the war, political issues, states' rights, modernization, sectionalism, the nullification crisis, and economic differences between North and South. So leading into that, we're talking about political issues. So in 1848, James K. Polk is not going to run for re-election, even though he could be considered among our most popular and successful presidents, potentially won the war, had certain objectives, including settling the border in Canada and uh, annexing uh, California and so forth. He accomplished those things and didn't run. The Whigs do not run Henry Clay. They run a popular war general. And so, of course, being as he knows nothing about politics and his name is not Henry Clay, he is going to win. The Democrats run Lewis Cass, last Jeffersonian. He believes in popular sovereignty in all the territories with regard to slavery. What is the significance of that position? To say, what does that mean to say that you believe in popular sovereignty in the territories? The for the people of the power. Yes. And so what, what broader implications does that have if the people have the power, if the people can vote to decide that issue? They get to choose whether it's slavery or not. They get to choose, yes. And therefore, who doesn't get to choose? What are the other options? A lot of times when you say, well, we'll define something, well, you need to also define it by sort of in making sense of it by saying, what is it not? So it means the people are voting, and therefore, who's not deciding it? The rest of the country. The rest of the country, which is embodied where? Congress. Okay, it means Congress is not deciding. This is maybe... The first place that we see very well illustrated three distinct positions. On one extreme, you have those that want to ban slavery from the territories. On the other end, you have growing up those who want to guarantee slavery in all the territories. And in the middle, you have this position known as popular sovereignty, which argues, let the people of each state decide. After all, that's how every other state did it, right? The first 13 states didn't have anyone telling them whether to be slave or free. They chose it for themselves, didn't they? And, and the next, about 10 states had it the same way. Starting with Missouri and going forward, they changed that. And so there were those who would argue that popular sovereignty was, was preferable. Now, the Democratic vote was split, in fact, because Martin Van Buren, former Democratic president, Jackson Crony, splits from the Democratic Party and runs on the free soil ticket. Creates a new third party that competes with them called the Free Soil Party, where they actually oppose the extension of slavery to the federal territories. And as you'll notice, see the Democrats and the Whigs in 1848, they are not taking positions on slavery. The Whigs take no position. The Democrats say each state could decide. And so those who support slavery blame its opponents for being the first ones to start to make slavery a national political issue. 